Our special senses allow us to pick up specialized information from our external environment. There are five special senses, smell, taste, sight, hearing, and equilibrium. These are the complex receptors. The receptors are very complex structures that are highly localized and found only in the head. Some of them are housed within the sensory organs, like the eyes and the ears. Others are distinct epithelial structures, like the taste buds and the olfactory epithelium. Our other sense, the sense of touch, is a general sense. These have simple receptors. Vision is our dominant sense. 70% of our sensory receptors are located in the eye, and half of the cerebral cortex is involved in vision. There are several protective accessory structures around the eye. The eyebrows help shade the eye. They keep perspiration out. The eyelids reflexively blink to prevent drying of the eyes. Also, the eyelids shield from dust. The eyelashes act as dust sweepers. And there are six muscles attached to the eye that act as extrinsic muscles. They move the eyes in all kinds of directions. Because the eye is subject to drying, there are several glands involved in lubrication. The tarsal glands, or meibomian glands, are modified sebaceous glands of the eyelids. They prevent the eyelids from sticking together. The ciliary glands are oil glands of the eyelashes. The conjunctiva is a transparent mucous membrane that lines the eyelids and covers the eye. The mucus helps moisturize the eye. And the lacrimal gland is the one that produces the tears. These are produced in the lateral upper part of the eye and wash across across the eye downward to be collected in the medial lower portion of the eye. Tears contain the enzyme lysozyme, which is an antibacterial substance. Tears drain directly into the nasal cavity. A chalazion is a cyst due to infection of the tarsal glands. A sty is an inflammation of the ciliary glands. Pink eye is conjunctivitis. This is an inflammation of the conjunctiva. It can be caused by either bacteria or viruses and is highly contagious, especially in children. Children touch things and then rub their eyes. The bacteria or virus can also spread from the nasal mucosa up the tear duct into the eye. Watery eyes occur when the lacrimal ducts become constricted. The tears can't drain properly. Again, an inflammation of the nasal mucosa may spread to the tear ducts blocking the tear ducts. Diplopia is double vision. Here the extrinsic eye muscles are not coordinated. And with strabismus you have crossed eyes. This is due to a congenital weakness of some of the extrinsic muscles. The wall of the eyeball contains three layers. The outer layer is a tough fibrous layer. The sclera is the white tough part that protects the eye and gives the eyeball its shape. The cornea is the clear anterior portion of the fibrous layer. This allows light to pass into the eye. The vascular layer, or the uvea, is divided into the choroid, which contains the capillaries. This nourishes the retina and the sclera. The ciliary body, which are the muscles that control the shape of the lens. And the iris, which is the pigmented muscle that controls the size of the pupil. This controls the amount of light that enters the eye. The inner layer is the retina. It's divided into the pigmented layer, which prevents light scattering in the eye, and the neural layer, which contains the photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. The internal cavity is filled with fluids called humors. The lens separates the internal cavity into the anterior and posterior chambers. The lens is a biconcave disc. It's transparent, flexible, and avascular. It does not have its own blood supply. It is held in place by suspensory ligaments from the ciliary body. The aqueous humor fills the anterior chamber. This is constantly produced and reabsorbed. It's a plasma filtrate that comes from the capillaries in the ciliary body. This contributes to ocular pressure and also nourishes the lens. The vitreous humor is in the posterior chamber. This is formed in the embryo and lasts the entire lifetime. It also contributes to ocular pressure. It helps keep the retina pressed to the choroid. The choroid contains the blood vessels that nourish the retina. The sclera and the cornea are part of the fibrous layer. The choroid is a part of the middle layer. It also has the specializations of the ciliary body, and here are the suspensory ligaments that are holding the lens in place, and here is the iris, the circular muscle that controls the size of the pupil. The pupil controls the amount of light that enters the eye. The retina is the innermost layer. This is where the rods and the cones are located. The lens divides the eye into the anterior and posterior chamber. The posterior chamber is filled with the gelatinous vitreous humor and the anterior chamber is filled with the watery aqueous humor. The pigmented layer of the retina is pushed against the choroid coat. 
The neural layer is the layer that has the photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. Then there is a layer of bipolar neurons, and finally a layer of ganglion cells. The ganglion cells are the cells that will make up the optic nerve. The blind spot is an area where the neurons converge to make the optic nerve and leave the eye. There are no rods or cones here. If light falls on this particular spot of the eye, you will be unable to detect vision. The pigmented layer of the eye is against the choroid. Then we have the photoreceptor cells, the rods and the cones, the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells. The axons of the ganglion cells are what will make up the optic nerve. Light will have to travel all the way through this to get to the pigmented layer, and then the signal for vision will travel all the way through these cells to get to the optic nerve. The region where all of the axons of the ganglion cells come together and leave the back of the eyeball to make the optic nerve is where the blind spot is located. The photoreceptors are known as the rods and the cones. The rods function in dim light. They also function in your peripheral vision. They are more numerous and more sensitive to light than the cones. The cones are the visual receptors for bright light. They pick up color. The macula lutea is the region of the retina that is mostly cones. The fovea centralis is the center of the macula. It is composed of all cones. This is the area of your very best vision. There are two sources of blood supply to the retina. The choroid will supply the outer third, the photoreceptor cells. The central artery and vein of the retina supply the inner two-thirds. These vessels enter and exit the eye in the center of the optic nerve, and they're visible in a living person. When a physician looks through the ophthalmoscope, he'll be able to see an area that's the optic nerve. The blood vessels you'll be able to see will be the central artery. The macula lutea is a denser area on the retina, and the fovea is that central area that is all cones. Retinal detachment occurs when the pigmented and neural layers separate. The vitreous humor can seep in between them. This will interrupt the blood supply. Because nerves are highly metabolic, if they do not have a good blood supply, they will quickly die. This can cause permanent blindness. Retinal detachment can occur if the retina is torn during head trauma or if the head is in motion and suddenly stops, as happens in bungee jumping. In some instances, the retina can be reattached using laser surgery. Glaucoma is a condition that occurs if the aqueous humor is either overproduced or under reabsorbed. This will increase the intraocular pressure. You'll remember that nerves do not do well when they're placed under pressure, so this extra pressure can damage the optic nerve and cause blindness. Because there are no pain receptors in the eye, no pressure receptors in the eye, this is completely painless, and many people do not realize they have it until they've had some loss of vision. Glaucoma occurs as you age, and it's very common in people with diabetes. Vitreous humor hemorrhage is probably the most common cause of acute decreased vision. The symptoms include floaters, little things floating across your visual field, or vision loss altogether. It can be caused in people who have abnormal blood vessels prone to bleeding, such as diabetics or people with sickle cell anemia, or if there is a rupture of normal blood vessels due to stress, like hypertension. To treat this, you need to stop the bleeding of the vessel and then reattach the retina if necessary. The lens is a biconvex, transparent, avascular, flexible structure. It's enclosed in an elastic capsule. The ciliary muscles are attached to the suspensory ligaments that hold it in place behind the iris. It changes shape to precisely focus light on the retina. Since lens fibers are continually added, the lens becomes more dense with age, more convex, and less elastic. Cataracts are when the lens becomes clouded instead of transparent. This can be a consequence of aging, diabetes mellitus, heavy smoking, or frequent exposure to intense sunlight. Some people are congenitally predisposed to have cataracts. The lenses can be replaced surgically with artificial lenses. Vision is the detection of light. Light travels in straight lines. It reflects, that is, it bounces off of objects. This is why we perceive objects in color. We perceive the color of light that is reflected from the object. Light also refracts, that is, it bends as it enters a different fluid medium. This is what allows us to focus. In this glass, you can see an example of refraction. The straw looks like it is separated right here at the line of the water. That is because light coming from the straw goes through water and glass before it hits the air here. Here it only comes through the glass before we see it. This refraction is what gives us the image that the straw is broken here at the middle. The convex shape of the lens causes light to converge on a focal point 
point a single point on the retina because the lens is flexible we can focus light that comes from different distances a thicker lens will give a shorter focal point the real image the image that's actually projected on the retina is upside down and reversed when light enters the eye it goes through the cornea the aqueous humor the lens the vitreous humor and the entire neural layer of the retina before it gets to the photoreceptor cells there are three places along this pathway where light is substantially refracted or bent when it enters the cornea when it enters the lens and when it leaves the lens and goes into the vitreous humor most of the refractory power is in the cornea we can change the curvature in the lens to allow for fine focusing of light on the retina our eyes are best adapted for distant vision this is called our far point of vision this is the distance beyond which no change in the lens shape is needed for us to focus appropriately twenty feet is the distance for a normal eye an emetropic eye the cornea and the lens will focus light precisely on the retina without doing anything we don't have to change anything about the eye at this point the ciliary muscle is relaxed and the lens is stretched flat by the tension in the suspensory ligaments now to understand this you have to understand that the ciliary muscle is a circular muscle when it's relaxed the diameter of the opening is going to be at its maximum that means the suspensory ligaments attached to it will be stretched to their maximum point this is what will pull the lens flat this is the state of the eye when we are looking at things in the distance our eyes are preset for distant vision vision at twenty feet or further away the ciliary muscles are relaxed so we have the largest opening possible those suspensory ligaments are pulled tight and the lens is flattened rays of light are nearly parallel when they come into the eye and they need minimal refraction in order to focus on the retina as we start looking at things closer up light from close objects diverges as it approaches the eye that is it tends to spread out a little bit this requires the eye to make some active adjustments using three simultaneous processes first the lens accommodates that is it bulges this means we will decrease the diameter of the lens and increase its refractive power the pupils have to constrict the pupils need to be just smaller than the diameter of the lens so that we make sure light goes through the lens and not around it and finally the eyeballs have to converge they have to inwardly rotate this also keeps the light focused on the retina in close vision the ciliary muscles contract as the opening of the ciliary muscles gets smaller the suspensory ligaments are relaxed and this allows the elastic lens to bulge so these rays are refracted by the cornea and then get maximum refraction by the lens this allows us to focus them on the retina in the appropriate place myopia or nearsightedness occurs when the focal point is in front of the retina that is the eyeball is too long distant objects appear blurry we can correct this with a concave lens hyperopia or farsightedness occurs when the focal point is behind the retina that is the eyeball is too short close objects appear blurry this is corrected with a convex lens and astigmatism occurs when there are uneven curvatures in different parts of the cornea or the lens think about the way light bounces off of a smooth pond or a pond with ripples an astigmatism is when the pond has ripples except the pond is your cornea we can correct this with special cylindrically ground lenses or with laser procedures in a normal eye we have the focal point just right on the retina in myopia the lens is too long so we give some extra refractive power by lenses in front of the eye and in hyperopia or farsightedness the eyeball is too short we use a different kind of lens again to correct the refraction of the light so that the light will fall on the retina in a precise point the rods and cones that are the photoreceptors are modified neurons they contain photopigments the photopigments all contain retinal and one type of opsin rods contain only one opsin cones contain one of three different opsins rods and cones are very vulnerable to damage they deteriorate quickly if the retina is detached and they're also destroyed by intense light color blindness is a genetic disease where there is a loss of certain cones certain opsins are not produced this is a sex linked trait so we see it in men much more frequently than we see it in women here you see the retina we have the pigmented layer 
This helps prevent light scattering. Then we have the photoreceptor cells, the bipolar neurons, and the ganglion cells. Light has to go all the way through the neural layer to get to the pigmented layer, and then we start the signal through the three layers of neural cells. In the dark, the photoreceptor cells are polarized. These cells use energy to hold open sodium gates. This means that the cells are constantly releasing neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter they release to the bipolar cells is glutamate, and glutamate is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so the bipolar cells are inhibited. When light strikes the photoreceptor cells, the photopigments change shape. The energy that was used to keep the sodium gates open and keep these cells polarized is now used to change the shape of the photopigment. It changes the shape of the retinal part of the photopigment. Glutamate is no longer released to the bipolar cells, so the bipolar cells can now depolarize, and they in turn depolarize the ganglion cells. In light, we say that the photopigments bleach. The retinal detaches from the opsin. In dark, the photopigments regenerate. This requires vitamin A. The retinal straightens back out and reattaches to the opsin. When this happens, the photoreceptor cells again release glutamate to the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells are inhibited, and so the ganglion cells get no information. The signal from the ganglion cells is sent via the optic nerve to the visual centers in the brain. Light adaptation occurs when you go from dark to light. When you first go from a very dark room out into bright sunlight, you're momentarily blinded by the light. As you've been in the dark, the photoreceptor cells became extra sensitive to light. When you go into bright light, the photopigments all bleach immediately. They have a very quick recovery due to adaptation to the bright light. In dark adaptation, you go from light to dark. Initially, it's really black when you go into the dark. You can't see very well. This is because the photoreceptor cells are not very sensitive to light. But again, they adapt to dimmer light. After you've been in the dark for a while, you can see more clearly. Nyctalopia is night blindness. Here, rod function is impaired. This is usually due to a vitamin A deficiency. People who have night blindness really should not drive at night. It's not safe for them to drive at night. Retinitis pigmentosa is a condition where the rods are selectively destroyed. These individuals lose their night vision. The axons of the retinal ganglia cells merge to form the optic nerve. These axons will then synapse at the thalamus. The thalamus sharpens the image and may even add information. Eyewitnesses are usually pretty bad witnesses because they add to what they've seen based on past experiences. The thalamus also separates the signal to help us with depth perception. The axons of the thalamus project to the primary visual cortex and the occipital lobe. This perceives and interprets the image. The optic nerves merge in the optic chiasma. Fibers from the medial retina will cross in the optic chiasma, but fibers from the lateral retina do not cross. This means that we have a right field of vision that goes to the left occipital lobe and a left field of vision that goes to the right occipital lobe. The overlap of the two visual fields is what gives you your depth perception. Here you can see the right visual field will stimulate the medial side of this eye and the lateral side of this eye. As this goes into the optic chiasma, the medial fibers cross, the lateral fibers do not. So the entire right visual field goes to the left side of the brain. The same is true for the left visual field. It goes to the right side of the brain. If you lose one eye, you lose depth perception. You also have a condition known as hemianopsia. That is, you see something with both eyes, but you only see half of your visual field.